I was thinking about this the other day. It's like was, I feel very fortunate to be part of a culture where if you stand outside and play music, people give you money, and that is. You know, I hope, hopefully that isn't something that's going to be lost in two generations' time because it is, you know, it's a very, very honest, honest thing where, you know, you're not going to become a millionaire off busking, but if you're waiting for a bus and you play for an hour, the chances are you get something towards your bus fare or a sandwich or, you know what I mean? And so, yeah, you know, that's, that could be selling out in one man's book. Like, oh, you know, you're just there asking for money, but that's. Is there a political edge to the way you think? Or uh, well, yeah, I'm sort of uh, passionately uh, anti-fascist. Uh, can think uh, the consumerist nature of our society is. Uh, Quite a quite a damaging a damaging thing, and people have their heads stuck up their asses about about first world problems. When really, you know, if you're born in England, you've won the lottery. I've always found uh, music quite week. interesting politically because um, there's all, it almost feels like the after Woodstock, you've got to be left because all the sisters love one another and all the rest of it. Yeah. And yet, musicians, by their very nature, a lot of them are very individual mm. and that sort of pushes them more to the right if you're only thinking about yourself well yeah and i always find that a bit of a contradiction i definitely think that the uh the music industry has quite a, a right wing mm. like sheen to it especially the more corporate you get because you know it's a very it's a it's very it's a very consumerist thing by its very nature and Try not to be uh, too judgmental. That's something I've learned as I've got older. You know, five years ago, I'd probably be a lot more. Uh, a lot, a lot less tolerant. But like I was saying, I think tolerance is a really important thing for for people to have. Because then you know, it's, it's, people can reach a consensus if people are tolerant of other people's views. Whereas if you go in there saying, well, no, this is my uh, this is my line in the sand and I'm, I'm not prepared to consider anything different, that's, you know, puts stop to intelligent conversation. Zappa, for example, is one of my favourite favorite artists and, you know, he was at the very forefront of home like, mail order and he, he carved his own, he carved his own furrow and uh, that's something that I really admire in that artist and, you know, he's one of the greatest Political minds, possibly of, mu of of out of musicians anyway, in the last 30, 40 years, and it's one uh, one amazing Frank Zappa quote that I love, and that's uh, some journalist said to him. So, so uh, you just spent uh, quite a lot of money on uh, hiring an orchestra for your for your next tour. Don't you think that's a bit of a waste of money? He's like, well, you know, some musicians make a bunch of money and stick it up their noses. I prefer to stick mine in my ears. <laughs> The coincidence, that's amazing. You look at my Facebook page, that's my quote. <laughs> I love it, uh, like that. You know, yeah, that's, that's just one little want. nugget of his, yeah. uh, of his wisdom, I think. Yeah. yeah, I've never really like gone out and like looked for a band or tried to build a band, like, but I'd say if, if even when I do join a band, I, I bring to it what my take on things are. So I guess those influences will come out through through what I'm doing, even though it might not be like the whole band is, you know, in those in those idea it, with that that in mind or anything. So. I always think that you add to a band. Some people join a band. You you add to a band. Because ah, so, <laughs> uh, any, anything that you're in, you, you just you just seem to change the flavour of it somehow. Mm. Um, is it something you're aware of yourself? Do you think? Um, yeah, I've brought something to this. Or, uh, maybe wouldn't wouldn't like to say. <laughs> yeah, because I think to say when uh, you were in Robinson that, that that band seemed to. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, definitely. Uh, you talked of the musicianship somewhere along the line. Well, put a lot of my own parts and like stuff into it. So the fact that 
you can see what I've done in it, I guess, it means that that, that that effect does happen, but I don't know, I wouldn't like to think that I, you know, walk into a band and just, like, stamp all over it and uh, detract from it in any way, or like, oh, it's about me, big, like, you know, big egos or anything. Uh, cause when I used to, I thought Robinson was great at that point as well. Uh, great, great songwriting, great storytelling. Mm. But like I say, with with you weaving your sort of um, fiddle playing over the top of it, it just seemed to give it a, a much more of a folky edge rather mm. than a sort of singer songwriter edge. That's that's yeah, yeah. I think there's always a bit of conflict in that band. Andy had a very had very strong ideas about what he wanted to do, and then. He didn't like the fact that it was becoming maybe more of a band, and especially when, because for a while it was cello player and myself, and then Andy doing his guitar bit, and then as like other members joined, the drummer joined, and bassist joined, and like people were putting more of their own mark on his music, and I think he, he was sort of trying to claw that that ownership back a little bit, but like you say, like the band made the music that that band made and it wouldn't be the same if if it was just how Andy had worked it out in his head. So like the Sexy Weirdos, so I don't, I might bring a, t a tune to the band and I'm not going to tell the tuba player what tuba part to play because he knows his instrument inside out, just like I wouldn't expect him to, to tell me how to play, play, play the violin. It might be open to ideas and as, as he would probably be open to ideas uh, but I suppose it's how it's put. If they say, I love that, can you do more? Yeah. <laughs> then you'd probably go, yeah, just keep telling me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, you know, but we also it's like mm, why don't you try doing that there? You know, you've got to be open. It's, at the end of the day it's it's not about five big ads. It's about making a good a good sound collectively. And uh, whatever's you know, best for best for the song. We've covered some of your guitar, violin, Narcoleptic Penguin. That's oh. a bit different. Oh, well. The school my mum taught at were having a, like a, an environment week or something like that, and jump percussion came up as something that could possibly be an activity. So, uh, so yeah, we did a, did a school workshop, and, you know, I'd been drumming since about 14 or something school music room just have your own drum kit and then played a bit in the toxic pigeon and, or like set up in but he had like a drum kit set up in a house and play on it and just part of that growing up playing playing music and uh, yeah and with the jump percussion it just worked out that we did a bit of workshops and oh and actually wanted to pay us and then started busking with it and so like, whoa people really like this so it's kind of a a way of a way of subsidizing like other other music that meant that I could still work as a musician and didn't have to like put put what I really wanted to do my ambitions with what I really want to do being touring recording playing Put that on hold to, you know, I've done loads of factory work, agency work, all that, and I'd kind of prefer to go out into town with my mates on a Saturday afternoon or a weekday afternoon and play drums for a few hours and get enough money to, to get by. It doesn't look rehearsed, it looks like it's all made up on the spot. It is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It looks like something you all really enjoy as well. It oh, yeah, like definitely. That. And like, I've played loads of violin in the street, but Tell you what, an hour playing the violin passes a lot slower than playing drums with a bunch of mates, and it's also more lucrative. So. What about instruments? Got any stories about the uh, guitars, violins? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, the viol one of my, like I said, my, my granddad sort of got got me into playing the violin in the first place, and then uh, he, he he died uh, a few years ago. And uh, but I, I inherited from him a, uh, a violin that he'd, he'd made, like by hand. And sat around s scratching it out with a bit of glass, like, really. And 
so I've got that instrument and then another like his his violin that he he bought. So I inherited both those that lovely instruments, which are very uh, fortunate. It was a bit very special playing one. Yeah, yeah, you know, like played the one he made like at his funeral and uh, it's more I don't I treat it more as a like a like a, a kind of a, a ceremonial sword rather than I wouldn't like take it out busking and stuff like that because it's, it's just it's, it's just priceless. So you played some pretty high profile gigs then John um, with uh, Not Electric Penguin, Big Chill, Tamo Do you want to tell us about the Big Chill one first? Yeah well the Big Chill came about because there was an advert in the local paper saying looking for buskers and walkabout performances so Ed got on it, sent an email, got 10 tickets to go to the festival so did that and then that happened for a few years in a row. Well, you started to get quite an audience, I think. Yeah, it was all really guerrilla. Like, you know, the best the best gigs we had were like at the festival because we just literally walk around with the drums and set up and play somewhere. But the best was when at the uh, you know the main stages of a finished, everyone sort of a bit zombified, walking around looking for some other music, and there we are in the field. Just boom, doo -doo, doo -doo, and everyone start like, MCing over the top. And the best one was the last, the last time we played there. And it was Sunday night. All the main stage music had finished, and we'd set up and we were drumming. And there was this massive, massive crowd around us. And security guards came over and and tried to stop it. And you could just see the crowd were ready to like just. They weren't big chilled. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was a real, real edit like really energised. And you've just been on tour with the Sexy Weirdos, yeah. tour in Europe. Do you want to tell us a few stories on there that can be broadcast? <laughs> <laughs> so we had three gigs booked. Didn't have a van until a week before, but through through uh, friends and clacks managed to buy a, buy a half decent van. So uh, yeah, got over there, drove drove to Prague. The uh, sparks out the exhaust at one point, but uh, we were going about 80 miles an hour. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah. So, yeah, gig in Prague. But first thing we did was went busking in the big old uh, Starry Mesto, the big old town square. Um, yeah, so did that. Had a good, good crowd of tourists and, that, and played a little venue. And went on to Leipzig where we had a, a gig booked in a, like, on a trailer park. Just a load of crusties and, like, really, like, by activists and that, and then we didn't have another gig book. That so that was the Friday and Saturday, and we didn't have another gig book till the Wednesday. But we went to Berlin. So people had some friends there, so we had, had a place to stay. I found an open mic night. Uh, narrowly avoided getting the van towed away in the morning from parking on a bus lane. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah. Went, went around busking in Berlin for the day and then found a gig in a venue that night and then drove through the night 700 miles from Berlin to Ghent and did the same there. Went out, went busking and um, then found a, found a gig to play in the evening and uh, you know, so like, oh, free bar, help yourself to the Belgian beers. <laughs> <laughs> And, and you know, we passed the hat round, the, the owner he gave us a load of money for petrol and that, and, uh, and then the following day drove to Caen in France, North France, and uh, played in a little, little bar with a funny little band that reminded me of the Toxic Pigeon, and like, yeah, went to a house, got really looked after and fed and watered, and you know, and the amazing thing is, even though we only had three gigs booked, because this magical busking malarkey where you can put your hat out there we, we managed to end up 35 euros up from you know it's hard work you know we didn't sit around on our asses it's so get up Newtown right carry the heavy instruments 